Come on in, have a seat, get yourself comfortable. Um, quick pop quiz. What is special about today? It is National Flip-Flop Day. Where are my flip-floppies? Unite, where are you at? Put your feet in the air. Come on, be cool with me. Show the dogs. Show them. Okay, get your flip-flops out. Okay? All I got to say is the real OG shoe is the flip-flop. Okay? By the way, I got in an argument with someone today, and then um, I, I was really very surprised that they took this position because I respect them deeply, and I think they're very intelligent. Um, but this time they weren't, right? It was just stupid what they were saying, okay? Basically, this person was trying to argue to me that a flip-flop is not a sandal. But a sandal, like he had all these weird things. He's like, well, they're shoes. They're both shoes, but one's a sandal and one's a flip-flop. I was like, nay, nay. They're both shoes, then the genre under the shoe is the sandal, and then the genre under the sandal is the flip-flop, okay? A flip-flop is a sandal, but not every sandal is a flip-flop. You feel me, okay? And what makes a flip-flop a flip-flop is there's two distinct, two distinct clear, clear things that they have over everything else. Number one is it has a little item that goes between your toe. Now, does that mean that every shoe you wear that has a little item that goes between your toe is a flip-flop? Nay, nay. It has, number one, an item that goes between your toe, and number two, it makes the flip-flop sound when you walk. It's the flippity-floppity, okay? That's where it came from, and anyone who disagrees with me, go to another church. I don't even want to see you here anymore, okay? I'm just serious about this. You, you don't even know who you are. I'm joking. I'm joking. Okay, really quickly, before, um, before I get into this, my VBS team... VBS team, where are you at? Let me hear you. Okay, a week from today, we'll be on our mission trip. We will have just completed dinner and started free time, okay? So that's a week from today. If you are on my VBS team tonight, turn to your neighbor and say, shh. If you're on my VBS team tonight, as soon as small groups are over, you're going to meet me in the training room across the hall, all of my VBS people, and I'm going to give you this final instructions packet, okay? Everyone who's on my VBS team is meeting me across the hall in the training room for like five minutes, no joke. After small groups, meet me there, and we'll talk. Sound good? Beautiful. All right, I'm going to open in prayer. Sound good? Okay. God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the fun we had. Thank you, um, man, Lord. I know that you have blessed some people with certain gifts, but tonight I learned some people, they just don't have the volleyball gift. And it's fun to watch. It's entertaining. And I'm grateful, God, that we can play a game. Um, we can have fun. We can laugh. We can even poke fun at each other and say things like, where were you aiming when you hit that? Like, I want to go to Tucson. Anyway, um, God, you're just good, and I'm grateful. I pray for this moment as we finish this series that we've been working on for the last four weeks. Um, I pray that what you've been doing in our hearts, you'd complete tonight so that we'd know how to move forward. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said? Amen. All right, I'm going to share a quote with you. We're going to put this up on the screen. We're going to open with this quote. We've been talking about the holiness of God, specifically talking about how many of us take God too lightly, okay? Um, if you're a first-time guest, I got two things to say to you. Number one, if you're a first-time guest, the hope is at this point right now that you're just kind of listening. This isn't a time for conversation. We're just kind of chilling out listening. Um, and number two, that you enjoy the time. You enjoy this, okay? Every week we do this. In the summer times we go to a pool, but, but this is for you. Um, that said, uh, this sermon, you're like coming to week four of a whole conversation. And if you've never heard, not heard the first three, it might be a little confusing. So I'm just kind of sorry about that. I wish I could just repeat all of them really fast, so like, and then you'd know it, but we don't have time. Anyway, so week four, here we go. This quote that's going to go up on the screen says this, the person who does not believe in God fears man. The strong Christian fears God, not man, and the weak Christian fears man too much and God too little. Are we going to put that up on the screen? Okay, we're not putting it up on the screen. It's fine. It's probably my fault. We'll see, you know. I'm like, I just kept like gently saying, we're going to put this up on the screen, and then it's going to be on the screen, and then maybe there's no one running the screen. Did I just not put the slide in there? Okay, cool. My bad. Does it say number four or number three on it? 
Okay, then we're good. I just forgot the slide. Sounds good. Let me repeat it for you since you don't get to see it. You ready for this? This is a great quote. The person who does not believe in God fears man. The strong Christian fears God, not man. The weak Christian fears man too much and God too little. Over the past few weeks, we've been having some difficult conversations centered around the reality that most of us take God too lightly. If you've been here, you're like, okay, now I'm starting to remember this, okay? Um, that quote by John Flavel, to me, sums up in many ways what we've been leading to, what we've been trying to get to tonight. And really, in this whole conversation, there's one thing that's left to do. There's one thing that's left to say. We've been saying, having this conversation about the fear of God, and we've never really taken the time to define it, okay? The first thing I need you to understand is the Bible uses this term, the fear of the Lord, the fear of God, and sometimes even trembling at his word over and over. I mean, these phrases that sound scary are repeated over and over and over from the beginning to the end of Scripture, Okay, They're, they never relent. They never let up. These are, these, are one of the, these are one of the things that is clearly one of the more important things to God, and it's called the fear of God. The problem is, when you and I hear the word fear, we think afraid. When you and I think of the word fear, when we hear the word fear, we think of afraid. So tonight, we have to unpack this. We have to understand what the fear of God is. And it's possible that last week, many of you had one of your first experiences with the fear of God. That was kind of the design, the hope. Our big idea last week was it's very possible for us to create a God with the given name of Jesus and yet not know the actual Jesus who's sitting at the right hand of God. Because many of us don't take the time to know Jesus... We, we, we think that we're following Jesus. We follow someone named Jesus, but we don't spend any time getting to know him. So we could follow a different version of him and hardly know it. We would never know. Federal uh, agents who are in charge of counterfeit money, do you know how they prepare to know counterfeit money? So how does someone get su be become such an expert on money that every time they see a fake, they can spot it easily? Do you think they spend a lot of time studying the fakes? Not at all. They don't care about the fakes. In order to prepare to study on how to identify a counterfeit bill, they spend hundreds and hundreds of hours studying the real thing. Because in order to know the real thing, you have to study the real thing. Many of us have accidentally slipped in this idea of following a version of Jesus that's not real because we never take the time to get to know the real thing. In Matthew 7, 21 through 23, we shared this last week. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter in the kingdom of heaven, but only one who does the will of my Father and who, who is heaven. Some of you will say on that day, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and, and drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles? Then Jesus will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from you, evildoers. The word knew you there is a word that describes intimate relationships. You see, God wants to know you, and God wants you to know him. The thing is, God knows you already. Psalm 139, he knits you together in your mother's womb. The reality is that very few of us take the time to get to know God intimately, personally. Matthew 10, 28, we shared this last week, says, Don't be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. After our conversation last week was pretty hard, I kind of tried to challenge many of us to get us to ask the question, like, am I following God? Am I, am I following Jesus? Is, is the Jesus that I've professed in, in my life to, is, is the Jesus that I've said is the only way, it is, am I following him or am I following someone else? And perhaps after hearing that last week, being reminded again this week, you're in a moment where maybe just for now, for the second, you're taking God a bit more seriously. And that was my hope. My hope is that you're experiencing even a small amount of this kind of undefined phrase, fear of God. Because as we learned last week in Proverbs 9.10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One and understanding. Here's what you need to see here. The fear of God is the one thing that helps us know him. So what is it? We've been saying the phrase a lot. It seems weird that the Bible would suggest that we should be afraid of God. So what is the fear of God? I 
think the best way to help you understand the fear of God is just to give you the big idea. Let's put this up on the screen. We serve who we fear, and we all fear something or someone. You can't really change the human condition. There's always an interaction that you and I have with fear. If we fear losing a friend or a boyfriend, we change our behavior in order to keep that person. If we fear that um, our parents are, are getting a divorce, perhaps, because, and then we begin to fear that maybe it's my fault, we change our behavior, we pivot. We can't help but serve what we fear. Or another way of putting it, we can't help but serve what we fear losing. And when you really take the time, and we don't have time to go through this in details, do it for you. When you really take the time and narrow everything down, there's really only two fears that we have to choose from in this entire world. And it's the fear of man and the fear of God. Every fear that you've ever felt is rooted in one of those two things, the fear of man or the fear of God. The vast majority of us very clearly fear man more than we fear God. Isn't it true that you want to be accepted by other people? That you want other people to like you or think that you're cool? You want to be loved by other people? You want to feel like you matter to other people? And we want to keep those whom we love and we know love us, we want to keep them near and keep them close and we want to never lose them. None of those things are bad that I just listed, by the way, but they are a reality of things that drive our actions. In fact, I would like to argue that to some degree, the fear of man is good. I love my wife. I never want to lose her. That should affect my behavior. In that sense, you could say that I fear Ginger. I'm not afraid of her, but I'm certainly going to act in such a way that would make her want to stay my wife. What I fear impacts my behaviors, and we all fear something. And the truth is, you and I, we think about and ponder and act on our fear of man literally all the time. It's the thing that keeps many of you, I mean, I, some of you have been in your small groups for the last few weeks, some of you younger got like, we've had some small groups who are struggling over the last few months. Like the thing that makes you the person in your small group that won't shut up is your fear of man. You either want to be seen cool or you don't want to be seen as someone who, who needs God or whatever. There's all these motivations behind your behavior in small groups. It's the thing that makes you choose who you're going to sit next to when you walk in here today. It's the reason why when you saw that person sitting by themselves, you didn't sit with them. You went and sat next to a friend because they were safer for you. Some of you are crippled by the fear of missing out. You watch social media and you see that your friends are doing this or that and you weren't invited or that or you've got this friend that you went around and some of you are still texting them right now as I'm talking. We are just crippled and led by our fear of man. For some of you, you're sitting here realizing now how, how true this is for you. You're like, wow, I don't know that I realized that before tonight, but... Sounds like pretty, it sounds pretty accurate to me. And you're just sitting here like, okay, this is something I'm, I'm realizing. I'm hearing this for the first time. Your eyes are open. You're like, wow, okay, I need to think about this. And, so, and others of you are sitting here so obsessed and concerned with how I perceive you or how other people perceive you that you're angry that I might suggest that, that I know this to be true about you. You're so concerned about how people perceive you. The mere thought that you might have something uh, off or different than what you think I might want you to think or someone else might want to, like, you, you just, you get angry. Anger is emotion that often arises in self-defense. Yet for a very small few of you, you're listening to me and you're processing and you're genuinely wrestling with this, whether or not it's true for you. And in the end, you say, No, that's not true for me, Mike. I don't really care about what others think of me. I only care about what God thinks of me. And that is the fear of God. It's the best way to define it. It's the only way I really know how. Is when a human being 
cares very little about what anyone thinks and values above and beyond and before and always more what God thinks about them than anyone else. That becomes a defining characteristic of who they are. And when that happens, it does this incredible thing. It frees them from the slavery of having to please and impress people all the time. fear of man is when our greatest fear is losing someone or something or some status or some perception. Or the fear of God is when our greatest worry, our greatest fear, our greatest concern is what God thinks. I'm going to pray one more time. Father God, I pray for these moments that as we close. Give me the words to say and help, help the ears here tonight hear. Because other than the gospel itself, what Jesus did on the cross, Lord, I can't think of something more important for us to know and live. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Many of us tonight need to come face to face with the reality that we may sing the songs, we may read the Bible, we may even pray, and you may even call Jesus Lord. But for you, this is all nothing more than a title because you don't spend one moment of your day obeying him. In 1 John 2, 3 through 4, it says, we can be sure that we know him. There's that word again. We can be sure that we know him. The language here is, is intimate knowledge. I know Ginger. I've gotten to know my wife over 20 plus years. There's this deep intimacy when it says no. We can be sure that we know him if we obey his commands. If someone claims, I know God, which I think many of us would, can we just admit that? If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commands, that person is a liar and not living in the truth. Remember last week when we read about the judgment where Jesus tells people who claim to be his, depart from me, for I never knew you. If you were here last week, do you remember that? A lot of us call Jesus Lord. A lot of us sing praises. But we, we really only calling God by his name. It's not an actual confession of faith or following because we don't obey his commands. A person who fears the Lord, hear me on this, who cares with utmost priority what God thinks of him or her is desperately focused on a prayer life that relentlessly invites God to help them live a life that pleases God. And they're desperately focused on God's word so they know how exactly to live a life that pleases God. That's someone who fears the Lord. I want to know God and I want God to know me so I get to know him by reading this book. I get to know this book. I talk to God. Like This is not something I just do because I'm supposed to. It's something I want. And I want to know him so terribly that I seek him in the two ways that I know to, to find him best. And that's in his word and in prayer. person who fears man too much and God too little will struggle to read the word. And when they do, they'll hardly get anything out of it. Not because there's nothing there to be received, but because they aren't seeking to know and please Jesus. Instead, they're simply reading the text to get it done so they can move on to what is next. Tonight, I want to present you with an opportunity. There are some of you in this room, and by the way, 
this group that I'm about to talk about, I'm glad you're here and I never want you to stop coming. There are some of you in this room who frankly could not care less about anything I'm saying. And that's fine. I, like, I hope, I hope you hear me genuinely. I don't know or expect or that everyone in this room every week is like, tell me all these words. I want to hear them right now. I'm going to give my life. Like, I want it all. Like, sometimes you're just distracted. Sometimes the boy next to you is cute, and you don't care about the, the, the fear of the Lord. Sometimes you get a text that just, dis, dis, like, disturbs you or distracts you, and it's just over. But some of you have been listening. And some of you are sitting out there, and I can tell because you're just locked in. Your heart's, your heart's kind of like, I, I think I need this. I think I might want to understand this fear of God. I think I might want to know how to do this. And if you're the first group, like, no shade. But if you could just give me five minutes of being quiet so that I can talk to the other group, I'd really appreciate it. I think a lot of the times we go to church and we hear preacher preach and you know in some way or another they're always saying we need to know this book we need to pray and when you hear those things all the time it's kind of hard to just not dismiss them and go yeah I know and I, and I do I try I give my best to, like I'll, I'll read I'll open the Bible a few times a day and it's great and I'll read it and it's it's whatever and I pray and sometimes I feel like I'm connected to God sometimes I don't I think what I'd love for you to hear and understand tonight is this. God never wanted you to read his book and pray your prayers just so that you could say you did them. God's not got some checklist up in heaven every night when you go to bed and you go, well, there's little Billy. He read and prayed today. I'm so proud of him think that's what we expect of God. That's what we think of God. But can I just tell you what God wants? And, and it's like the most important thing to him. It's the reason he sent his son. It's the reason why at, ju at the judgment he's going to say, depart from me for I never knew you because that's the only thing he ever wanted is he wanted you. And he gave you himself and he gave you this book and we misunderstand it. Can I tell you the way to know God the way to fear God, the way to care about what no one else thinks in this world, the way to be set free from the fear of man and all of the other things that hold your heart captive is literally through this book, but not the way you think. You see, here's the reality, and I'm going to say some stuff that might sound weird, but this is not just some normal book. There is power in these words that is other and super and, and, and not natural, but only if you come to them for the right reason. I mean, and let me put it like this. I fear God. I don't care about what anyone thinks. I mean, you've seen the stupid things I do. It's pretty clear I don't care what you think. I say bold things, I, I pray bold, th like I don't care. And that fear of God is still growing even stronger in me. Do you want to know why? Because when I open this book, I'm asking two questions every time I read. I'm not just going, okay, I'm in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and I'm going to read ten verses 1 through, okay, I did it, Lord, I'm, thank you, Jesus, help me have a great day, amen, go to school. That's not my approach. I'm in this book, and I'm reading. I'm, I'm trying to understand, but you know what I do with it? I ask two questions. The first one is this. What did I just read tell me about God? 
Like every time I open the Bible, I'm sitting in this, and I'm, I'm not just reading it and moving on. Like I'm sitting in this going, what, what is this telling me about Jesus? What did I learn about his character? What did I learn about his heart? What did I learn about what he wants, about who he is, what he says? Like wh what am I learning here? What is this text actually telling me about my God? And when I do that, you know what happens? My brain does this thing it's gifted with. It's called learning. When you put stuff in your brain that you care about and you're paying attention, like your brain will keep it. I open this book seeking to know him better. And every time I open this book seeking to know him better, you know what it never fails to do? Not once. What it never failed to do for me is tell me about my God. First thing I do every time I open this book is I ask the question, what am I learning? What does this tell me about God? You know what the second thing I do? I go, Lord, what are you asking me to obey that I'm not? If I really fear God, and I'm, I'm going to look at him one day and say, Lord, Lord, you know what I want him to save me? Come on in because I knew you. I knew your heart and you knew mine. You know how he's going to know I knew him? Because I obeyed him. I followed his commands. I lived like he asked me to. That's the evidence. You have one job as a follower of Jesus. Obey your king. And so every day I open this book and I ask it, what am I learning about God? And what is it telling me I need to obey? And in asking those two questions, I get to know God better. And I learn how he wants me to live. And in those two things, you know what happens? The only thing that matters to me is that I please him. My fear of God impacts the way I treat you. My fear of God impacts the way I speak to you. And not always. It's not like I'm perfect. I'm still human. I'm still a dummy head. <laughs> I invite forsake this world and get to know the God who made you and saved you. And there is one way. And that's intimacy with him. You talk to him in prayer and you let him talk back as you read his word. And you don't just read it to say, I did it. You engage with it. You, it's almost like you eat it. <laughs> Like, you consume it. You snack on it. Like, I don't know how to put it. It sounds weird, but, like, I don't read this. I consume it. I'm not just reading it and moving on. I'm asking questions. What does this tell me about God? I'm asking questions. Lord, you just told me that you want me to love people. Okay, do I do that? Like, do I do that well, Lord? Do you, am I someone that loves people? Like, God, if I'm not, or if you want me to get better, would you help me with that? Because I, wanted, I, wanna, I want my life to please you. And I just read that you want me to love people well. Help me do that, God. Every day I engage in this. And I invite you to do the same. And I think some of you are ready. I think some of you want to know God better. And I think some of you want to live in a way that pleases God. And the rest of you who don't, I'm glad you're here. Keep coming. Following God or caring about God or believing God is not a prerequisite to coming to church here at Compass. We want you here no matter what you believe or how you feel or what you think.
because I know that God loves you. So we want to love you too. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're about to enter a summer where this youth group is going to focus on obedience. We want to have conversations about what it looks like to live a life that pleases you. We want to help students who are interested in pleasing you to learn how to live that kind of life. And Lord, I think the world would try to tell us that, that there's no fun in that. And I just cannot overstate how the opposite is true. You have not had fun in this life. You have not known joy in this life. You have not had peace in this life until you know the God that I know. You are joy. You are peace. You are the creator of fun. And Lord, if we just knew you, if we would just open the book and seek to get to know you, we would find you. If we would just open the Bible, Lord, you have made it so clear how you want us to live. I pray that your spirit would meet us, those of us who are convicted right now and want to do that well, Lord. I pray your spirit would meet us as we try to do that, God, and you would help us make it happen. And that we would develop an incredible life-giving fear, the holy fear of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Before you go, please pick up your garbage. Um, stop by our prayer wall on the way out. We'd love to have you write down a prayer request. We'll pray for you every before we leave um, every night. Um, also, we have some summer flyers on the back table. If you're, if you're interested in knowing what we're doing this summer, please grab one of those. Um, but that's it. Let's go to groups.